Cameroon is a Central African country with a diverse cultural and linguistic heritage, mimicking Africans' heterogeneity. Her population was estimated to be more than 25 million inhabitants in 2019. Apart from endemic diseases like malaria, Cameroon, like many other low- and middle-income countries, is experiencing a surge in the burden of non-communicable diseases, some of which have genetic origins. Given the infancy of genomic research in the African context, there is a significant gap in understanding the origins of genetic conditions in African populations. Through the partnership between the University of Cape Town and the University of Yaoundé One, issues relating to genetic diseases in the African context are explored. These issues include discussions around understanding the effect of receiving a genetic result in an African setting. The collaborative center in charge is named IFGENERA, an acronym for Individual Findings in Genetic Research in Africa. IFGENERA seeks to encourage the professional development of future ethical, legal, and social issues experts by offering many professional development opportunities to young African scholars. Dr. Kenye is one of the beneficiaries of this professional development program. His research was based on a rare genetic condition known to be the leading cause of intellectual disability in the western region of Cameroon. Intellectual disability is a pathology that is given very little attention in our community. It can be defined as a mismatch between a child's chronologic age and their mental capacity. It is often discovered during school delays. Unfortunately, genetic conditions are unknown in our community. Educators and teachers do not have sufficient information about the different genetic causes of intellectual disability. In a rural community in the western region of Cameroon, several families are known to have more than one member affected by intellectual disability. The causes of intellectual disability in this community are diverse and mainly revolve around anthropological and social issues, with the primary explanatory model being that of a curse. It is recounted that the chief founder of this village cursed his wives and daughters because they did not take part in the mourning ceremony of his intellectually disabled server. This was described by many villagers, including the wife of the current chief. Nous arrivons aussi trouver ces enfants aliénés comme ça par l'aide de malédiction que c'est ce qu'on avait fait qui avait un un aïeul qui était à la chefferie et que quand il est mort les les femmes de la chefferie sont parties au champ. C'est ce qui a poussé à ce que leurs enfants soient aussi comme ça. Selon ce que aussi j'ai entendu, on raconte de l'aliénation de la chefferie que c'est parce que les femmes du chef avaient maltraité l'aliéné que le chef avait à la chefferie et que ce n'était pas l'enfant du chef. Pourquoi l'auteur avait maudit sa famille Mon grand-père était très très social et tout le monde venait chez lui. Et il avait un homme de main qui était, comme on dit en patois, Et alors mes tantes, mes tantes étaient toujours en train de jouer avec lui, se moquer, rire. Alors un jour il a dit, comme vous êtes toujours en train de vous moquer de lui, vous allez accoucher ce genre d'enfant. This cursed social construct has been passed on from generation to generation. One of the chief's granddaughters, Mamangia, refused to accept this narrative of curse. Mamangia has three male children, two affected by intellectual disability. The common name for the condition in the village is Rura, 
and is understood to be a milder form of intellectual disability. Rougar, c'est celui qui est retardé mental. Un enfant rougar aura l'aspect d'un fou parce oui. qu'on ne prend pas soin de lui, par exemple. Mais c'est pas un fou parce que il va faire les tâches ménagères, on va l'envoyer, il va aller au champ. Il, en fait, il fait ce qu'un enfant normal peut faire. Et seulement, son raisonnement est un peu plus moindre. Quoi. In 2009, Professor Ngefak received Mamangeya in his office with her two sons. They presented with dysmorphic signs and developmental delay. He then contacted Professor Ambrose who contributed to diagnosing fragile X syndrome in this family. Nous avons reçu cette dame qui venait de Baminda, adressée par un aîné, une gynécologue à l'hôpital général. Et qui m'a appelé, m'a dit « Oui, j'ai ma fille qui a ses enfants qui ont un problème neurologique. Est-ce que tu peux avoir de la disponibilité pour les, pour les voir ?» Et très très rapidement, j'ai organisé un rendez-vous dans la semaine. Et j'ai reçu cette dame avec ses deux garçons qui présentaient un retard psychomoteur évident avec des signes dysmorphiques. Et des signes dysmorphiques qui nous, fait, qui nous ont fait penser à un syndrome de l'X fragile, notamment la macro -orchidie. Notamment les grandes oreilles décollées, un faciès particulier et des troubles, une hyperactivité importante, des troubles du comportement très très importants. Pour ce projet, c'est une famille qui a été initialement vue par le professeur Serafin Gefak, cette famille de fragile X syndrome dans l'ouest de Cameroun, une molécule qui a été diagnostiquée par notre service et à cause de l'exceptionnel big number of uh, children suffering from this condition that is associated with mental retardation of fragile X syndrome. Because of the fabulous history and the legend of curse in that specific family that we personally witnessed while seeing the very first patient, actually the mother of the first two children that we saw, the project developed around this context. To understand how fragile X syndrome is transmitted, we will review basic hereditary information. Every person's body is made up of millions of tiny structures called cells. Within each cell is the genetic information that we inherit from our parents. We generally describe this genetic information as the library of life. Like in any library, it has shelves and books. The shelves are also known as chromosomes, while the books are the genes. The alphabet used in these books is known as DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. And the different letters in this alphabet are C, G, T, and A. C being cytosine, G, guanine, T, thymine, A, adenine. Most people have 23 pairs of chromosomes. In addition, 22 of these 23 pairs of chromosomes are numbered from 1 to 22. They are the same in males and females. We call the 23rd pair of chromosome the sex chromosome because they determine a person's sex, either male or female. In females, both sex chromosomes are similar and are called X chromosomes, while in males, they are different. We have one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. The fragile X syndrome gene is on the X chromosome and is called fragile X mental retardation 1 gene. This gene is responsible for producing a protein known as fragile X mental retardation protein, which is important in normal brain development. Individuals with fragile X syndrome have a deficiency in this protein. The kind of mutation that is found in fragile X syndrome is a repetition mutation. Let us imagine a sentence, I like banana. The majority of people will read this sentence like, I like banana. Some are going to read it like, I like bananas. This is a mutation that is still understandable. But sometimes, the sentence, 
I like banana will be mutated into I like banana na 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 This length of repetition can never be understood. This is the kind of repetition that is found in fragile X syndrome and is related to the occurrence of three letters, cytosine, guanine, guanine. A woman who carries a mutation on the fragile X mental retardation 1 gene has a 50-50 chance of passing it to her child, whether it being a son or a daughter. This is because she has two X chromosomes and she passes one of the X chromosomes in every pregnancy. On the other hand, a man with the same mutation on the fragile X mental tradition 1 gene passes it to all his daughters and none of his sons because he passes only the X chromosome to his daughters and the Y chromosomes to his sons. Given a fragile X syndrome genetic diagnosis to a community has ethical, legal and social implications which needs to be explored. So in the Cameroonian study what is really important for us is that we got some insight into this relation between how people make sense of genetic information in, in a traditional way um, versus what modern genetics or, or modern medicine tells us about um, genetic disease. And the interplay between how the family that participated in the study makes sense of, of fragile X in their community versus you know, the, the diagnosis and what that then means for how we think about illness well, gave us really wonderful insight into you know, what matters for people are different in different ways. Like when is medical genetic knowledge relevant for how we think about illness and how does that intersect with other ways in which we understand disease in communities for instance and in families. Unfortunately, the causes of intellectual disability in this community may be misunderstood and this could lead to a stigma power relationship between community members and the affected families. The primary role of this stigma power dynamic is to keep people away from families with intellectual disability or exploit the influence that this affected family could have in the community. Quand même dans une famille royale. Donc du coup, beaucoup de parents au village aimeraient avoir leur, leur fils ou leur fille dans, dans la famille royale. Donc du coup, quand un de, de nos enfants avait des préférences ou bien des vues sur, sur quelqu'un, Il suffisait juste qu'ils disent que je veux telle personne. On va aller vers, vers cette famille et puis les choses vont être arrangées. Quoi. Donc, je me dis que c est, c est, ce sont des, mara, des mariages arrangés, pas des mariages d'amour. Je suis pas très, très à l'aise dans la relation. Bon, J'ai été obligée d'interrompre. Après maintenant, dans les conversations qui passaient de gauche à droite, on, on racontait comment on lui disait que toi aussi, tu veux même te marier, tu vas dans une famille qui accouche les, les rigoles. Tu t'attends à quoi Les enfants qu'elles accouchent là sont des enfants à charge toute la vie. Donc du coup, je me dis que logiquement, s'ils traînaient même, s'ils faisaient certaines choses, c'est parce que Les, les on dit donc ça fait que le mariage s'est arrêté pas seulement ça même maintenant les, les gens qui connaissent l'histoire quand ils t'approchent et que tu refuses et que tu crânes même quoi c'est même pour vous faire plaisir vous même qui accouchez les peut-être vous même vous n'êtes même pas bien vous même dans vos têtes là L'inquiétude que je peux avoir, c'est juste au niveau de ces tantes qui sont obligées d'avoir des enfants à charge toute la vie. Donc, c'est assez difficile parce que quand un enfant naît, il grandit, il devient autonome. Et généralement, même quand un enfant devient autonome, c'est lui qui aide ses parents. Donc, les tantes qui ont ce genre d'enfants 
sont obligés de prendre en charge des enfants toute la vie, quoi. Donc, ça devient. Elle a besoin de soutien. La famille doit être là. To establish a trust relationship with the community, the research team organizes community engagement activities to confirm fragile X syndrome in the different affected families. Ten meals of whole blood was collected from these families and shipped to the University of Cape Town for DNA extraction. The diagnosis of fragile X syndrome was done at the Grutter School Hospital in Cape Town. After this, a pedigree of the family was drawn. This pedigree revealed that the family's traditional head was probably a normal transmitting male carrier. Experts in genetic counseling argue that detecting a carrier status early will increase the therapeutic options and promote acceptance. So the medical benefits of receiving a result um, is vast. Uh, the sooner we receive a medical diagnosis, the sooner we can actually intervene. And in the case of Fragile X, it's particularly important to get an early diagnosis as lots can be done for that child in order to um, make sure we have the best outcome for the child and the family. With Fragile X in particular, um, there has been reports of extremely late diagnosis up to three or more years which means that the child has already missed one or two years of pertinent, like very important medical intervention, which could improve their life. Um, and surveys of hundreds of parents have showed that there's a lot of negative consequences to not receiving a timeliest medical diagnosis. Parents have said that um, they sometimes had to convince their doctors that there was something wrong with their child, or they had to find somebody that's knowledgeable enough to perform the correct genetic test. Um, depending on the disease, again, that you're dealing with, in many instances it can bring an end to what they term diagnostic odyssey, where you keep looking, keep searching, keep testing, keep x-rays, scans, ultrasounds, all sorts of, you know, MRIs, all sorts of things. And once you actually have a molecular confirmation of, of something, it brings the end to that. So it, there's an economical component to it, obviously, but also the psychological component, knowing what is wrong, and then if being able to focus on moving forward with this instead of being stuck in that sort of uh, uncertainty and looking for reasons for what's, you know, what's wrong with, with my child. Is it something that I did? Is it because I fell down? Is it because I went on that boat trip when I was pregnant? Um, all those sorts of things. Giving back results to genomic research participants is a sign of respect and a response that our engagement with the participants has been proper. In addition, we want participants to become change agents in their communities since the process of returning a genomic research result is a moment for the families involved to have an insight into their genetic makeup. So one of the things that is really important for us is to make sure that the people who are donating their samples into the genomic research get something in return, right? That, that, that their effort is recognized, especially if it's easy for us to address what, what they need. And one thing that we found in our research is that the people, especially people who have historically been excluded from information, right, they might not have have received um, loads of education, they're excluded from the knowledge economy, they're excluded from the economy. Um, these people tend to really have a thirst for knowledge. The people want knowledge, they want to be explained what the research is about, but they also want to receive information that empowers them to actually um, take care of their own health better. And this is something that our research direct, directly responds to, so genomic research helps us to help people think about their future health better, right? It help it empowers them to take better care of their future health. And for me, the return of results is one way in which we empower people who might not have lots of knowledge about their future health or about their family health um, to actually 
live better lives. So what we've been trying to do with this general research is understand better the context within which um, research participants live and within which genomics research takes place. So that researchers are better able to understand both what participants expect, why they expect that, and how we can return results in a way that people understand. Um, and, and critical questions there are, for instance, about should it be the medical doctor that determines results? Um, should it be perhaps a genetic counsellor or a nurse or someone else? Should we ask people to share information with their families or not? And, and when we learn about health, and this is what the Cameroonian study really focused on, is when we learn something about our own health, do we tend to share that with our families or are we worried about things like stigma, for instance, or other things that make us not share? And how does the research process um, impact on us? So if general research really helps us understand better the context within which the normal research takes place, so that we can help researchers do a better job in, in deciding whether and when and how they feedback individual genetic research results. Besides South Africa, where there is a clearly established genetic services, genetic training, genetic curricula, uh, genetic scholarship, uh, there is not a lot of African country, excluding maybe Asian and Tunisia, and to some extent Morocco, where we have such a setting. But if we think about the burden of disease in Africa, sickle cell disease alone in most part of Africa is 2% at birth. Mm -hmm. In the amount of 300,000 newborn for sickle cell disease that occur in the world, 80% are born in Africa. So by the virtue of that fact, each African country should have a genetic service that cater only even just this very big group of human people. Mm -hmm. The second reason we need to improve the limit of our diagnostic tools. We know that the molecular approaches used for genetic condition doesn't only apply for human, it's also applied for infection. For example, in South Africa, the diagnostic of TB using gene experts, for example, actually is a molecular approach that, that actually have put us in a competitive advantage at the time of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. We know that if we do not have the molecular technology available in this country, we will not have discovered or that value that allow us to completely change the public health approach in our COVID-19. So the genetics it's, it's too important to be a matter for genetics alone. It is a matter for infectious disease, it's a matter for the whole society. The reason why we should not at all hesitate to invest in genetic technology. A new world is rising. Every day we're learning and thriving. African minds together united to the cause. We're looking for answers. We're solving all the mysteries. Science and medicine is the key. We're looking at our DNA. Together united, we're finding a way. Cause everyone has a right to live without any disabilities. Our strength is our resilience. We stand to make a difference from the villages to the lands. We're testing and gathering facts. Slowly we're bridging the gap, we're finding a cure, a cure to the past. Ah.